subscribe to our channel and be blessed by what God is doing. Amen? I just want to also make a couple announcements. In about two weeks, we will be having All Nations Day. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, that was a pandemic clap. We need an All Nations clap. I said we will be having an All Nations Day. That's right. <laughs> it is of most blessed to, can you, I think my thing is all too high. So it is the most blessed thing that we have in all nations. It's what marks who we are. The, the numerous cultures in, in our branches all over the world. I, I wish I knew the ultimate number of uh, cultures we had. I know in Toronto alone it was above 60. So I can imagine where else and what other cultures there is in each branch. And so it is, of, it is awesomely awesome what God is doing. Amen? So you don't want to miss it. All Nations Day. And then next week we have a special guest, a general in the Lord, a special sort of the spirit that is coming to preach here. We won't tell you who, so you have to attend. Hallelujah. But this one is special. This one, you will be blessed to have this one in your presence. I'll give you a clue. You're going to announce your presence in his presence. Hallelujah. So if you don't get that clue, then I'm sorry. But it is going to be spectacular. It is going to be awesome. You want to come in early, be part of the praise and worship. And then the following week, it's going to be All Nations Day. We are waiting for head office to give us further instructions, but we are one of the branches that signed up for uh, a predominant culture. If you have a predominant culture in your church, you would sign up. And we signed up because we are flowing in the Caribbean colors. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> we, we flow from jet chicken, right? To goat curry, curry goat, right? Chicken curry, curry chicken. You know, I don't know how, well, the debate is plenty. I've been around them enough to know how much they dislike the names change. <laughs> but, uh, but their food tastes amazing. And, and in, in fact, I was speaking to the events head just before we, 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 we were going to plan this. And we said, ah, you know, we are limited 15%. But we will try to do some small food here. We, we have to try to do some small food here. At least we can go colorful, come colorful and not be full. Some small culture food. So we have to plan for one, two people to make some food. Amen? And then we, we go home chopping. Hallelujah. So it's, it's, we're going to do some small. We're not big enough to do big, but small, small. I want to see some Dominica something. Hmm? I want to see some Indian something. Hallelujah. Right? I want to I wanna see some Jamaican flair. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I wear the St. Vincent's and St. Lucia's and the Grenadines. I want to see all the good food. Hallelujah. Amen. Of course, nonetheless, Ghana and Congo will be in town. Hallelujah. Amen. And then the king of Africa, Nigeria, will be in town. <laughs> we only call them king because of population. It's not because they're the best. <laughs> so, so it's going to be a spectacular wonder. And it's going to be a denominational service. And you're going to see all branches represent their predominant culture. And so we are going to be blessed. It's going to be an all nations flavorful flavor, flavor day. Hallelujah. So, flavor, flavor. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> Hallelujah. So it's going to be awesome. And it's going to be spectacular. So I don't want you to, next two weeks, it's going to be added. But today is such a special day. But before we get to the amazing word of God, the men gathered and we were walking in the lights. You know, we gathered our branch, we gathered a few men for the three days and we chopped the word together. It was special, wasn't it? And oh, yes. 
And we want to give a special thank you. I know they like to go unnoticed, but I don't like to get people unnoticed. As far as I know, I will say it. So that's why you don't tell me things too early. Hallelujah. <laughs> because me, I will share the goodness of God in the land of the living right away. Do you know that these two sisters, Carrie and Nika, hosted the men all three days? And we, we ate fried rice, noodles, chicken wings, pizza, go, some, some special uh, beef thing. I don't even know what it was called, but it was so flavorful. Hallelujah. I, I don't know what it was called. I just ate it and I said, amen. <laughs> That's it. I didn't have, to, I have time to ask what is this? What kind of meat? This? Thank God I have no allergies because I just ate and ate it so beautifully. Hallelujah. So God bless you ladies. God has blessed them and they will be blessed surely. Amen? Amen. And so we have a testimony in our midst before we get to the word that Dr. Donko has prepared for his people, for the people of God. We have a testimony for our brother Eric who, for those who don't know, he moved all the way from the Sioux. They call it the Sioux. But if you don't know what that stands for, it's say it's mostly Sauce Marie, but it's French. It's Sauce Marie or Marie. Hallelujah. So he is coming to share a testimony that he received that God did for him, or met testimonies, because there's plenty. You know, and uh, he wants to share because he was amazed. And I said, This testimony must be shared among God's people. Amen. So please come and share your blessed testimony. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So um, thank you very much, Pastor Nana, for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, share today. And uh, my testimony, it's uh, last, I think it was uh, last two weeks, Pastor Nana was, uh, was teaching and uh, he was talking about giving. So um, I was sitting down back there, and um, he said, do you know that your first paycheck goes to God? And I was like, oh, really? Um, he said, yeah, everything has to go to God. No, um, no debating about it. He, he was distressed. So I was like, I was, because I just got a new job, and I was like, oh, I have to pay my rent. I have to pay my bills. I have so many things to pay. And I was like, you know what? This is really, really difficult for me to do. So I debated myself the whole week. I was really, really <laughs> angry about the situation. <laughs> I was not happy. But um, one thing I noticed was that um, God is speaking through uh, our pastor. So I have to obey whatever thing he says. I was thinking that um, I was using my logical brain to rationalize what he was saying. But no, that was not the case. Like um, Brother Adam said, do not try to um, rationalize what God is saying. The things he will tell you to do will not make sense, mm -hmm. but you just have to do it anyway. So yes, um, when I got my paycheck, I just gave out everything, even though I was not happy, but I still did it. <laughs> and um, just like last week, what happened was um, I was just talking to someone and the person just said, hey, Eric, I have uh, money for you. I was like, really? Wow. I just went and looked at myself at the mirror. I was like, assuming I did not give out my first paycheck, I wouldn't have gotten this. And God has already uh, provided for me, like, my rent, like, my bills to be paid. So I don't have to worry. So all I had to do was just to obey whatever thing Pastor Nana said. And um, I'm just going to leave like this uh, passage. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's uh, Matthew 6, 33. But first, seek, but, first, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I was that person. I was the person who was worrying how am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to pay for my expenses? But like the Bible says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Like God cannot lie. He cannot lie. Like his word is true. So I um, try as much as possible to just obey. 
Um, that's what I would like to share. Thank you very much, Pastor Nana, for giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate you and all the members in the um, NFGC Cambridge. I appreciate everyone. I do not take you for granted, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. So, one of the things that also, uh, but before I say that part, do you know he, he didn't say the amount, even I don't know, all I, he told me was what he gave to God, he got triple back. As a surprise, but it wasn't a surprise. The principle of giving in divine way and as a Christian, when you obey, God does respond. That's all. And so God responded. It's, it's supposed to be a natural thing, right? And for those who are wondering, what does it mean by every, no, not every first paycheck. Your career job, your first career job, you give your first paycheck. Not every career job. <laughs> Your first, if you want to do that, that's up to you, but really the principle is your first career job. Why? Because Abraham gave a tithe to all when he started his first journey. You understand? And so your first career job goes to God, and then your second one goes to your parents. That's how it operates. You understand? And so for those, for those who are wondering, oh, I didn't do it, it's not too late. <laughs> it's not too late. This is your time. This is your hour. Amen? So you, some of you, your paycheck is even bigger than the first career job paycheck. So it's really half now. So don't delay. Go and push pay immediately and go, boom, boom, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and just allow God to bless you as well. Amen? <laughs> hallelujah. We have to have some fun with this because talking about money, people are too stressed. So I like to make jokes about it all the time. Hallelujah. Also, you know that he got a gift from God. He got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Yes. At the men's gathering at the place that our sisters hosted us at their place, after the second, the second night, we prayed together, and then God just moved in my spirit to pray for him and for us to pray towards him. And in no time, literally less than a minute, he was eager and ready, eager and ready. And suddenly the gift of tongues just started to flow out of his mouth. And then he said, Pastor, after the whole thing, he said, Pastor, I feel so different. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that's how you know it's genuine. He didn't even want to leave my hand. He just, he, holding me like a baby, I said, wonderful. This is God powering you and empowering you to be a restored man. Hallelujah. Thank you. God bless you. So without further ado, our, our general, our senior pastor is going to take over our service and we will listen to the key to a happy home. This message will bless your heart, women and men. So please send it to your friends. Send it to your WhatsApps and your Facebooks right now and let everybody else enjoy it. God bless you. And my topic is the restored man is key, is the key to a happy home. The restored man is the key to a happy home. And my test is taken from Ephesians 5, 28 and 29. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. This is an important scripture. It talks about the family. It talks about how to enjoy one another, how to ensure there is peace at home. And it says husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. So to me, it is one of the most interesting Bible passages about the family. 
It talks about the relationship between the man and the woman in a family setting. And the Apostle Paul simply tells the man to love his wife. This may sound elementary. This may sound even childish. One may say this is too basic. We want to hear something powerful. How to enjoy the relationship with our spouses. How to make it very, very uh, interesting. And then all you tell us is the man should love his wife. What is this? But in so doing, he put his finger on man's main problem. What is destroying many marriages? What is destroying many relationships? The inability of the man to love the wife. But I want us to look at it from the very beginning. I want everyone to understand that a family is first made up of the man and the woman. No child yet. No one else. It's just the man and the woman. Later on, the children may come in. It could be one child or it could be several. They could be adopted or they could be, biologic, um, they could be biologically uh, produced, all right? But you need to understand that at this time, I don't want to include dogs and cats as members of the family. I'm talking about the human component of a family. Do you know that the main issue, the main problem we have when it comes to marriage is lack of love, sometimes in the relationship. And according to the Apostle Paul, the key to marital bliss is for the man to love his wife. And it shouldn't be the other way round. We shouldn't wait. Sometimes, to my amazement, men complain, oh, my wife does not love me. My wife does not love me. My wife does not love me. And when you ask why, the man is going to tell you hey, she doesn't fix food, she doesn't do this, she doesn't do that. Really? You need to understand that the Bible does not command the woman to love the husband, but rather commands the man to love the wife. There must be a reason for that. And the Bible tells us in simple terms to love her as we love our own bodies. Simply put, the word of God says to men, do to your wife what you do to your own self, your body. Do for your wife what you do for yourself. The reverse is equally true. Do not do to your wife what you not do to yourself. Because nobody hates himself. Do you know that nobody gets up in the morning and gives himself three slaps, pam, pam, pam. Nobody does that. Or hits himself or takes a knife to chop off a limb unless the person is sick. But nobody does that. Is the reason the Bible tells us to love our wives. And it says in verse 29, nobody hates himself. Nobody hates himself. Nobody hates his flesh. You don't hate yourself. So do not hate your wife. 
You don't beat up on yourself. So don't beat up your wife. The measure of love to bestow on your wife must be equal to the measure of love you bestow on yourself. If you buy one shirt for yourself, you must buy two blouses for your wife. I used to say in the past that if you buy one shirt, buy one blouse. No, do you, this morning it arrested me that women actually need more clothing than men. If you allow me, I can use this same suit till it's torn before I replace it. But my wife can do that. So when you buy one shirt, buy two blouses for your wife. That sort of love will make every home beautiful, true or false. You will be amazed. Okay, now let's move on. Why must men or men love their wives? Again, in Ephesians 5:28. The Bible is very clear. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. This verse reveals things. This verse reveals that love for the wife is not automatic. It's not automatic. We think it is. I can even dare you by saying love for the wife has to be learned. You see, we equate the, the emotions we have, the feelings we have for the opposite sex to mean love. If that were so, then men will have, in fact, abundance of it. And the word of God would not admonish us to love our wives. It is something we need to learn. I don't know about you, but when you first marry, sometimes the way you speak to your wife, and even if your wife were to complain, you argue. But as you learn to love your wife, you sit back and you say, no, I shouldn't be talking to my wife like that. Then you become more sensitive and more, quote unquote, sensible. The way you treat your wife changes. You don't argue over unnecessary things. If that's what she wants, praise the Lord. If that's what he wants, hallelujah. And you see that there is harmony. I've said it, it's natural for a man to have feelings for a woman. But that, you see, to us, that is love. But love is caring for the person just as you care for yourself. So it is imperative for the man to learn how to keep loving that woman until the home has more joys than tears, more laughter than frowning, more joy than pouting and growling. Now the question is, how can man's love for his wife which isn't automatic, be cultivated and nurtured for the home to be peaceful, how can it be done? To answer that, we need to look at the, the very beginning. We need to go to the beginning. We need to go back to creation. In Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. It is abundantly clear from this scripture that Adam was created first. In 1 Timothy 2, 
13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. This scripture gives us a lot of insight. What does it mean that Adam was, was formed first? It means that before Eve came along, Adam already existed. Adam was already living on this planet. Adam had established himself. Adam had a way of life, a pattern for living before he ever got his wife Eve. Once you understand this, it will help you in all these uh, unnecessary arguments will come down. In Genesis 2 verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. In other words, Adam already had a home. He wasn't a street person without a living quarters. He had a home. He would go to work, come back, come back, and then lay his head and rest in his beautiful garden. So he had a home. He had his own home given to him by his creator, by his father God. In Genesis 2, 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Not only was it his home, but the garden was very vast. If you study the Bible and you notice all the boundary lines, it covered several countries. And his job was to tend it, to keep it, to make sure it's not overgrown. When you go to a beautiful garden that is manicured, you see it's so lovely, it's so beautiful. You enjoy it. And this is exactly what Adam was called to do. God placed him there and asked him to tend it and to keep it. It simply means that God gave him a job. Adam had a job. He had a responsibility. And I want you to take note of this carefully. Because the misunderstanding can bring a lot of confusion in a relationship. Before the woman or wife came along, he had a job. He had a responsibility. In fact, some of us don't think about it, but Adam was a manager. He was a manager of creation. He was in charge of everything created by God. Look at Genesis 1:26. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So you notice that he had to subdue everything. He was in charge. It's amazing. And this is very significant. Man's first calling was not to the family. But his, his first calling, unfortunately, to some of us, we think is wrong, but was to his job and responsibility. In Genesis 2, 19 and 20, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. 
But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Can you imagine for a moment, I want to crave your indulgence. Adam was a man given responsibilities by God to subdue creation, make sure that everything was in order, everything would fall in line. He was to keep the, the garden. And now God, the creator, creates all these animals. And he brings them in birds and he brings them to Adam. He goes to the workplace of Adam and he says, here is a responsibility for you today, Adam. And he says to God, what is it? And God says, I've created all these for you. I've created all these animals and birds and reptiles, every one of them for you, so name them. And God takes uh, a lazy chair and he sits in there, rocking away and watching Adam. And Adam said, look, you, you be called a duck. You, you be called a donkey. You, you be called an ass. You be called uh, this and that. And God was watching with glee. Why? Because, you see, Adam, this is one thing sometimes we miss. We don't understand that man is wired up to work. It is so important you get this straight. Now Adam is doing all these things and God is watching him. Adam at work. As he has brought all these created animals to him to name. Isn't it amazing? He will name you and maybe take a uh, a book and something and write it. That's my own imagination, but he remembered every name. And it's a good thing the woman wasn't there because if the woman had seen uh, even a cricket, it was, she would have screamed. Some of them are afraid of even cockroaches. They scream, isn't it? So it is good that no lady was present. So Adam could play with all of them, all the gogomins, or every one of them, you know, without, you know, see every one of them, all those things. Can you imagine if a lady happened to be there? Oh boy, that job would never get done. No, 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 not this one. This one is, is filthy. I don't want to see this one. But Adam was so excited. Name him every one of them. And, and it also pleased God. Adam's greatest delight in life was to fulfill destiny, to please God through his job, through his work, by taking care of his responsibilities. His fulfillment was not pleasing a woman but his creator through his work and his responsibilities. Man's devotion to work dates back to antiquity. It goes all the way back to the beginnings. It is more natural for a man to love his work sometimes than even his wife. And it's not because the person doesn't love his wife. You see, we need to call a spade a spade and stop creating unnecessary friction in our relationships. Man's life revolves around his work more than the family. So he was engaged in doing these things. He would go to work and, and spend all day and then come back home and sometimes grab just a couple of bananas and eat and, and he would snore away without even taking his shower. No woman to back him. He's, it's okay. 
Later, the woman comes along. Conflict begins. Dichotomy begins. The balancing act begins. This is where many men struggle and many women struggle because we have not been taught right about the family and how the two should complement each other to fulfill destiny. We've not been taught right. In Genesis 2.18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper com comparable to him. A helper to help him fulfill all these tasks and assignments, all these jobs that he must do. And so the woman comes along to aid him in his business, in his enterprise, in his work, in his responsibilities. But before then, he was used to all these things. Now someone has come. He's not in the purview of this, this um, ministration to cover how we need to take care of the other responsibilities that have come in now, like the woman, but because time would not permit. It will require a series. In Genesis 2, 21 to 24, First, I would like to read through, and then we take it verse by verse. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Imagine Adam wakes up to a great surprise. What was that? What surprise was it? A, a woman. Wow. And in verse 23, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He descends it properly and says, this is like me. Remember God said he will make a help meet someone comparable to him, not something different, totally different. Not a monkey, but in his own semblance, in his likeness, someone comparable to him, someone similar one with the same kind of, of uh, substance. And this is, I can imagine, the, the joy on the face of God to see Adam's reaction. The first time seeing someone like him. Do you know that he was used to seeing monkeys and, and donkeys and horses and all these wild animals? This is the first time he has seen someone who looks exactly like him. And not only that, that person was magnetic, was attractive, was beautiful. But I want you, I want you to watch something beautiful here. In verse 22, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. God walks this beautiful woman to Adam. 
This is where we got the bridal match from. In, in Africa now, we dance to the wedding, isn't it? The, the bridal match where gong, 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 no, now we dance koyo, koyo, and like that. And can you imagine God dancing with Eve to, uh, but we take it because everything that comes from Africa is perfect. So we take it like that. But this is where we get the bridal match from. God walked down the aisle to Adam with Eve. And this is the desire of every woman to be walked majestically into the arms of a man. Into the arms of her husband. Now Adam is on cloud nine. So ecstatic about this beautiful person. He is seen for the first time and he blurted out, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The similarity was obvious, not like all the other created uh, beings around. The comparability with the woman was undeniable. So in verse 24, God oversees the ceremony and he pronounces this blessing upon them. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. Do you know that man is still struggling to fulfill this scripture in its entirety? Because in Matthew 19, 3 to 8... The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any cause? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So he says to them, all this divorce business is not God's perfect plan. And all these Mary, Mary and Susie and and Adam marrying Steve, not God's perfect plan. In the beginning, he created the, um, the man and the woman, and he joined them together. So it's important you understand this. And you notice, they question him and, and ask, why then? Should Moses, remember as far as they were concerned, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, what they always wanted to prove to him that, who are you to question Moses? Moses, we know, was God's man, but you, we don't even know where you're from. They said that to him. So they said to him, if you are telling us divorce is wrong, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Eight. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. In other words, it has never been God's perfect plan. It has never been God's perfect will. But Moses permitted it because of the hardness of man's heart. And we, we're not to get into that, else it will take us off on a tangent. Because you know that um, sometimes the things that transpire in relationships can blow your mind. Some people can be so mean, you wonder where they learn that meanness from. So 
divorce is due to the hardness of heart, mostly towards the wife. Paul says the solution is to love the wife as you love yourself. To nourish and cherish the wife as you nourish and cherish your own body. Because the body now has become one. If you spend money on your wife, you don't go stand somewhere and say, you have no idea. My wife is too expensive. She's a spendthrift. And this and this and that. No. That body is your body. Now let's look at the difference in man and woman. Or the differences. Some major differences, we're not talking about biological features. Some major differences that create conflict in the home. The first thing the man was introduced to by God was not to a wife but to a job. To a responsibility. He was the manager of creation. Isn't it amazing in the Psalms, he says, but what is man that thou art mindful of? You made him a little lower than the angel, and yet you have subjected all creation under him. So man was, man was loaded with responsibility. That was what he was introduced to first. And God did not make a mistake. Now, the modern theology wants to change all of that. It's amazing, but I will tell you without mincing words that, you see, hence man's motivation in life is to his job and responsibility. Solomon says, man's heritage in life is to enjoy the labor of his hands. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20. Here is what I have seen. It is good and, and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. If you've never been a man before, you never understand this. But a man without a job is very, very difficult. It's not fun at all. When a man has a good job, a job he loves, it adds years to his age. Do you know that, that um, I mean to his life rather, it, 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 it do you know that it is scientifically proven, it's a fact, that when some men retire, they die easily, when they have nothing to do. They get up in the morning, they are so bored, they just don't know what to do. Unless you keep yourself busy. If you retire because you have something to do and you do it, but just to sit home. Some people think, oh, you, you retire and then you sleep. No, you die. Uh, if you're a man, <laughs> if you're a man, oh, there is an ab abundance of research in that. And so, it, you see, for man is wired to work. Man loves to work. If a man does not have anything to do, you notice you are not yourself. You are not at your best you, because you're not productive. You were not created that way. And Solomon, had, you know, says that. Do you know that sometimes man will choose work over food? 
If you look at John 4, 31 to 34, in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The first thing the woman was exposed to after being created by God was to the husband. And the first act was a wedding ceremony. The first steps she took led her into the arms of her husband. No wonder marriage and family are everything to a woman. Whereas jobs and responsibilities are everything to a man. Hence when boys are raised by their mothers alone, some seem to lose their identity. Some get confused about their sexuality because in certain cultures, especially when we were growing up, if we were a boy, your father wouldn't get up to go to the farm and leave you to, to, to hang around your mother. Who born you? He's taking you along. But they will leave the girls to stay with their mother and the girls would teach them and, and the women would teach the girls what to do. That, that, so that's how it is. And you know that you can read the Bible, you find that whatever the father did, the boys also. It, you just did the trade. You learned the trade. You apprenticed the trade your father did. Because Joseph was a carpenter, Christ became a carpenter. Whatever, so that's how it life or society was programmed. Do you know that when boys are raised by female only, some never get to witness what true manhood is about, jobs and responsibilities, getting up early in the morning and your father going to the farm, and you following. Even if you are too young to weed the whole place, at least you can weed just that you are learning. No wonder the Bible clearly teaches that in Proverbs 13, 22, the first part, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A good man, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So money, so making money, that is working a job and having responsibilities are first and foremost man's calling. And nowhere is the contrast made clearer than in the following passage. In Proverbs 19, verse 14, houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife to make that to happen so that there will be enough for the children when the man passes is a gift from God. You notice God said it's not good for Adam to be alone. I will make a helper comparable, someone to help him fulfill his, his uh, responsibility to discharge his duties. And so uh, here comes Eve, beautifully put together. And then guess what? Adam was so excited. And so now they've become a team. But you notice that here the Bible makes it clear that inheritance comes from the father. 
inheritance of real assets comes from the Father. But let me say this before I move on. Today, the theology has all changed. The theology is being, oh, the man's first call of duty is to his home. I don't find that in the Bible. And do you know that they quote the, um, from Timothy what Paul said concerning appointing pastors? He says, if a man does not know how to take care of his home, he should not be appointed a pastor. So we use that to mean that man's, but that's not true. Do you know that? Do you know that the Bible is very, very clear that if you cannot take care of something small, if you are not faithful in that which has been committed to you, if you are not faithful in small things, nobody is going to promote you, nobody is going to give you a bigger responsibility. You cannot take care of your wife and children. How can you take care of the church of God? That's a bigger responsibility. That's a greater responsibility. And so the Bible says such a person does not qualify. He's not qualified to be appointed. But it doesn't mean that man's first um, call of duty is the home. That's not. And it's the reason we have a lot of conflict. Man's call of duty remains what it is. You must be a provider for your family. You must work. Don't sit home and let the woman go work for you. No. That hasn't changed. God has not changed that. It has not changed. God has not changed that. And the witness is always there. When a man doesn't have money because he doesn't have a job, which man can say he's the happiest because he doesn't have a job and he's broke? No man will tell you that. We take that statement which Paul made because we're talking about character. And... and and you know that children take after their parents. If you're all messed up at home, you're not able to um, lead an exemplary life at home for your children to copy. How can you lead God's church? That's what it is. I've told you that God has asked me to write certain books when it comes to ministry, family, and I'm going to shake the world, but I'm waiting for a few more years. When I grow gray, right now my hair is still black. <laughs> but that's what it is. You see, in this scripture, inheritance of real assets comes from the Father. Whereas women's tie to the family is reassessed. It doesn't mean women don't make money. Nor does it mean that men do not have any role to play at home. That's not what we are saying. We're talking about primary functions. The primary thing that man is supposed to, to do. And the primary things women must do. But if a woman gets up in the morning to go to work and comes home in the evening just like you, then there is the need for you to support responsibilities at home. You, you too can flip the hamburgers. You too can help. But you notice that when I'll get to that in a minute as I conclude, women work these days, unlike in those days. 
And so all of us can share in certain responsibilities. But the truth is that the man is more wired up to go out and make money for the family in order to provide inheritance for the children. That pleases God. That is man at his best. That is what the Bible defines as a good man. Whereas the woman is wired up to love the family more. Had it not been that way, where would majority of society be? When the man gets angry and he takes his shirt and he walks out, who takes care of the children? How come the woman does not have the same propensity to walk away from the children? It's not possible. Because they are wired that way. That is their primary calling. She could be a prime minister. She could be a president. She could be the head of uh, a corporation. She could be a medical doctor. It doesn't matter. She still has more instinct towards the children than a man. A man can walk away and never even blink an eye. And look back to see if the children have ever eaten. True or false? That's what we're talking about. And God himself compares a woman's love with his love towards us. A woman's love towards the children with his love towards us. Can a woman's tender care cease towards the child she bears? Even though they do, but it's not something. But a man can just walk away. Do you know the number of men who don't know the number of babies they have walking about on this planet? A woman gives away the, 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 the child, the daughter, and still thinks about it every day. So for each to fulfill destiny, there must be a clear understanding of the role each is called to play in the family. God did not bring competition. He brought unity. He brought support. He brought complementarity. He wanted the woman to complement the man and vice versa. That's what he brought. And that's what God wants you to be. So my final question is a series of questions. How else can the man make so much money for the family and leave an inheritance for the children's children without working a job? You agree with me that he has to work a job. Whether he owns a business, he's still working a job, right? And also by taking responsibility. But how can he fulfill that role of being a great provider? He can only do that by loving his work, right? How can one love his work unless he spends time on the job. How can you do that without conflict at home? Unless the woman understands this principle and permits the man to love his work and take responsibility without the woman feeling neglected, rejected, and abandoned. And this is where the conflict comes. Do you know that some men Pass. They just reject promotions because the woman at home is a tigress. You're spending too much time at work. You don't love me. No, 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 no. He loves you. He really loves you. But there must be an understanding that he's wired up to work. If he's promoted and, and, the, and the higher he goes, the more attention required to the job and for 
his job. So you need to know that so that there is no conflict is the reason if you look at it and because we don't observe it God wants us to take a Sabbath rest that is the time you stay at home and look your lover in the eye don't even blink from morning till evening and satisfy her but when you are gone you work in a way Today, I have to just say, praise the Lord. Nobody is excited about my sermon, but that's fine. But that's the truth. There should be no competition here. Let's complement each other. And the man must love the wife and spend time. And I've already said that Take time off. The day of rest must be the day you spend time with the family. But on the job, leave her alone and stop him alone and stop calling every minute. Where are you? Um, where are you? And, uh, when are you coming home? And, uh, no, stop that. Today, I won't get any clap from the ladies. So, men, why don't you clap for me? And let's give God praise. <laughs> blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. I was just joking. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So, <laughs> Mama Rose is going to pray for all the ladies. That the ladies will understand that, look, if, if your man loves his job, it doesn't mean he does not love you. He loves you. You are the reason he's slaving. The children, the reason he's working hard in order to provide. And your support, your assistance is what is enabling him even to do more. I've always said it. Without her, I don't think I would have been able to do all this. If I have to cook every morning and cook every afternoon and cook every evening, it would have been tough, right? It would have been super tough. I don't think I would have been able to do a quarter of us. So that's what it is. So please pray for the ladies so they don't fight us. And then you, you, you grab a mic and come and pray. Shall we all stand? And she's praying for ladies right now. <laughs> Let's lift up our voices. Thank God for tonight. We thank God for the service. We thank God for the word. Lift up your voice. Father, we give you worship. We give you praise. We honor you for your word. Your word has come to enlighten us, to give us the ability and the grace. Father, we thank you that our men are restored. They are restored in their homes, their businesses, and their workplaces. Oh God, Father, we thank you that you created Adam and from him you made Eve, oh God. Father, we pray that we will complement each other and work together, my God, to bring about unity and peace and harmony in the name of Jesus. Father, grant us that grace, the understanding. My God, I pray that you give our men the grace to love their wives. And Father, I pray you cause the men, oh, oh God, to live together in peace. And Father, I pray for every woman in this house in the name of Jesus. Father, you have called us, oh God, uh, to, to, to support them, to help. And therefore, may that grace come upon us, oh God, in the name of Jesus, to encourage our men, in the name of Jesus, to pray for them, uh, Father, I thank you for the wisdom of which you made men and women for a purpose, for a plan. So that our homes will be, my God, a place of peace and of joy. Father, may this word change us, O oh God. Cause us to be doers of the word and live according to your word. So that your purposes and your plans, my God, be according 
accomplished and be established on this earth. Thank you for this Father's Day, oh God. May you bless our men. My God, may you promote them. My God, may you cause them to love you, to fear you, and to be praised in our homes. Father, I pray that even that restoration will begin, even as you spoke to us throughout the weekend. Father, may you start now in every home that grace and peace will rest in, on our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated and let's uh, bless God with our tithes and our offerings. And wherever you are, um, as we uh, give, please remember that when you test to 77977, click um, only on the city. Take, for example, if you are in Edmonton, you click on Edmonton so that the offering will go to your church. And if you are not a member of all nations and you, but you enjoy um, ministry, then give, click on the Toronto um, um, icon and then give to Toronto. We love you. You can also call the number at 1-888-263-4272. 1-888-263-4272. You can also give by electronic, uh, electronic transfer. And um, for those in Toronto, it's jpabi at nfgc.org. And uh, some of the churches have their own e-transfer set up. Use that as a member of that congregation. We want the men to know we appreciate them, including our little boys. We, we love them, and um, I know that they are men in the making, and God will use them. So bless God with your tithes and with your offerings, and uh, I will call on um, you know, Reverend Dr. Cynthia, please come and pray. We haven't, uh, I haven't seen anybody in a long time. Come. Shall we rise? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Father, we don't have enough time to give you praise, to bless you, to appreciate you, to thank you for all that you do for us, especially these times time of the pandemic we are so grateful to you that we have started coming meeting together to worship you what a joy we say thank you father we thank you for the word it liberates and we thank you for the opportunity to worship you with our tithes and our offerings father we do it cheerfully we do it abundantly because father what you have done for us is so much Father, we give it to you, and we know that you use it for your own good purpose. May your name be praised. Amen. Amen. So join us wherever you are to give to the Lord. And um, grab your elements, your communion elements, um, and let us observe the Lord's Supper. And... Um, Let yes, please help us distribute the deacons. Please help us distribute the communion. And um, if you have them, if you don't have it, just raise your hands, and then the deacons will help you get, grab your own. Okay. Anybody who needs one. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup of supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Today, what you hold in your hand, the bread, 
the wafer it represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who, who died for us God's gift of salvation but if you have a husband you have a son you have a little boy today I want to pray a special grace being Father's Day upon their life that that salvation Jesus brought to mankind will reach them. I want to pray for any wayward son, any husband that is not in Christ. Let's pray for our men. Talk to God right now. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, shall we pray. Heavenly Father, we pray and thank you for the gift of life that you bestowed on mankind through your only begotten Son, Today, as we celebrate Father's Day and honor all men, we ask, so God, that every man who is not saved, every young person within this fellowship who does not know you, Father, save them. For Jesus was broken that we may be saved. Save everyone, all husbands, all sons, all young men associated with us from the Philippines to Brazil and throughout the continents. We thank you in Jesus' name. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we partake of it together? In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Shall we pray, Father? We thank you for the shed blood that has redeemed us and paid off the debt of sin. For without the shedding of blood, no one could have his or her sins remitted. Therefore, especially our fathers and every man connected, every boy, every male person, Father, save them, deliver them in Jesus' name. Shall we partake of it together? Father, we thank you for all the great and wonderful things you've done for us. Thank you for the man and the woman you created. For it's your purpose for us to live together in harmony, that the two shall become one. Therefore, we pray for unity. We pray for empowerment for every man those looking for work that you will grant favor, open doors for them. Father, bless everyone in Jesus' name. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and his power, his presence rest upon you now and always. Amen. Praise God. So, sorry for the technical difficulties. I was saying that 
All Nations Day, as we said, is in two weeks, two Sundays from now. Um, and the events team will be contacting. Well, they'll make an announcement on the, on the groups, but they may also specifically ma um, make contact with some of you guys to joyfully bring your culture because we're going to present something, a pre-recording. And so we need all hands that are called to be on deck. Amen? So please enjoy the Father's Day. Celebrate your, the men. Men need to be celebrated. They need that to be tolerated. Hallelujah. Celebrated and not tolerated. Praise God. Happy Father's Day and enjoy the rest of your day. See you in the evening for tonight's service. God bless you.